We are at a landmark sermon today. I don't know if you know this, but I looked back on the calendar, and the first sermon preached going through the Sermon on the Mount was January 31st of this year. We have been talking about this sermon for literally all of 2021. That's wild. Jesus preached this thing in, in probably what would have been shorter than the normal sermon that I preach, because he's a much better teacher than I am. He's much more concise. Um, and he, he packed so much into this thing that it has taken us seven months to get through this sermon. This is a landmark day because today we're going to finish the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if you feel like celebrating that, if this has been a difficult one for you. Uh, I'm kind of bummed. Uh, man, this, is a, this has been powerful. But today we're, gonna, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to end. Jesus comes to a conclusion. The reason I'm sitting down uh, is, is because Jesus was sitting down when he was teaching this sermon. And he was the best teacher of all time, so I'm just trying to be like him. All right? I'm just stealing his style today. But the reason he sat down, by the way, was traditionally when a rabbi would sit down to teach, they would sit down to express, I have something important to say and I want you to listen, but also to express, I am an authority on this issue. Now, I'm not sitting down because I am claiming to be an authority on this issue. I'm sitting down today to set the tone, but also maybe to get out of the way and let Jesus, the authority on this issue, speak, hopefully through me. So, Jesus, I, I hope that you would do that today as I as I look to teach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that as Jesus comes to end what we call the Sermon on the Mount, um, we reflect on the fact that he is so far taught about how to live a life that God would call blessed. He's corrected some bad theology. He's pinpointed some specific ideas and, and ways of living in the kingdom of heaven on earth. He has said some radical stuff. In fact, it's this sermon that really started the trajectory of people being so mad at him for being so countercultural to the Jewish traditions that this was kind of a pivot point that led to his crucifixion. So he made some fans and he made some enemies by teaching this uh, sermon, which just for the record, if you've ever preached the gospel, you might make some fans, but you'll also make some enemies, right? So our job is just to be faithful to say what God said. So now Jesus finishes his sermon on the mount with uh, what, I, what I would say are three warnings. To me, as I read his conclusion, it seems to me that Jesus is offering three warnings against looking for hope in the wrong places. In fact, that's going to be the title of my message today, Where Not to Place Your Hope. And uh, to set the context of that, why don't I read to you the entire conclusion of Jesus' sermon. Listen to it all in one chunk, and then, and then I want to break down these three warnings that I believe that we can see uh, in this text. So our text today is Matthew chapter 7. I've been reading this to you out of the CSB, uh, and I'll continue that. Starting in verse 13, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Be on guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit." Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the, same, the answer, by the way, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Right? You, can't, you can't get anything but figs from a fig tree and thistles from a thorn bush. That's, so the answer was clear. In verse 17, he continues, he says, In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Jesus must really want us to catch that illustration. He's now repeated himself a couple of times. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? 
then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. By the way, if you're reading your Bible with any kind of an open heart, that verse right there should probably make you shudder just a little bit. It should make you just at least a little bit nervous, right? That you would get to heaven and find out God would call you a lawbreaker and you thought you knew him. And he says, sorry, you're not on the list. I can't, I can't let you in. <clears throat> By the time we're done with this message today, you'll understand who Jesus is actually talking about so that you can make sure you don't end up on that list. Jesus continues here. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the wind blew and pounded on the house. And it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. If you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, those, those three, there's, there's a few different sections there. These, these teachings actually sound familiar. Maybe you've never actually heard them all in their context, they, they, how they flow together. I, I would actually argue that Jesus is saying in these multiple ideas, he's actually saying one thing. We'll talk about that by the time we're done today. But again, Jesus is giving us these three warnings for where not to place our hope, to make sure we don't place our hope in the wrong place. So Jesus is saying, you, you, might, you might say, and this is how we'll frame this teaching today, is that Jesus is giving us a warning to be careful not to look hope in misguided ways, in misinformed teachers, or in misplaced confidence. We'll come back to each of those three before we're done today. But let's look back at uh, verses 13 and 14. Let me read these to you one more time. This is the first section as we look at how Jesus gives us a warning not to place our hope in misguided ways. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. Enter what? Enter into the kingdom of heaven or enter into eternal life. Enter into heaven. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Now, we won't spend a lot of time on the Greek that Jesus uses here, but just one word I'd like to clarify is that the word that in this translation we see as road, in other translations it might say way or path. Uh, that's the Greek word hodos, which literally means path, journey, road, or way in the literal translation. But Jesus is using this metaphorically here to, to talk about a way of living or a, a way of worshiping God. So enter by the way of living or the way of worshiping God that is narrow, that might be considered difficult or too narrow uh, for others. Now, just to put this into kind of a modern context, according to the most recent census in the United States, there are over 7.7 uh, .7 billion people alive in the world. 85% of those people consider themselves to be religious. There are 4,300, give or take, uh, one way or the other, I don't know how many, but around 4,300 different religions or sects of religions or, or like regional practices of, of worship and tradition that those 85% of the 7.7 .7 billion people in the world practice. That's a lot of different ways of living and ways of worshiping uh, a, a God. And Jesus comes along and says, only one of those religions or ways of worshiping God leads to eternal life. This is going to maybe sound like a little bit of a random story, but the other day we were watching Avengers Endgame and Infinity War with our, with our family. Um, Hannah and I have watched all of them, and, and Sharon and Sayla felt left out, and so we started the whole series over, and we finally got around to the end. And, and so we were watching Infinity War, and, and it struck me something that I, I've kind of, like I think it was a, kind of a cool moment, uh, but, but it, it struck me again, especially as I think about this text. There's this one moment. This is not a spoiler, by the way. I'll try not to spoil anything if you haven't seen it already. But, um, but, but Dr. Strange, is a, he's a good guy. If you don't know anything about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, <laughs> welcome to Life Church. Pastor's a nerd. All right. 
So Doctor Strange has this moment where he is using his powers to look into all of the possible different future outcomes of their battle with the big bad, whose name is Thanos. And, uh, and Tony Stark, who's Iron Man, also a good guy, same team with Doctor Strange, he comes along and he says uh, to Doctor Strange, he says, how many, how many futures did you see? And he says something like 14,635. It's like some wild number of, of possible outcomes of this battle with the big bad, right? And then Tony Stark says, how many of them did we win? And Doctor Strange says, one. And what struck me when I was watching that is how all of nerddom just bought into that. 14,635 possible outcomes and only one of them, the good guys win. And everyone was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and yet when God says there's 4,300 religions in the world and only one of them leads to eternal life, we want to go, that's so unfair. Like, the God who has the actual real ability to see all of the possible different outcomes, who measured every possible different outcome and set in motion, not just said, this is the way that people will win, but I created the way that people will win because he loves us so much. And we want to say, rather than, than, than saying, thank you for using your power and your love for us to see all of the possible outcomes and then create a way for us to win, we want to say, why can't all of the ways win? I, I don't want to take a lot of time here, but, but this is what Jesus is trying to get us to understand. The world will tell you, uh, yeah, just do whatever you want. Just be a good person. And Jesus is coming along and saying, there's actually only one way to get to life. All of the other ways, it's a, it's a wide highway. It might seem really, really nice while you're on it. And so it's almost like Jesus is saying, do you want comfort now? Or do you want eternal life later? Which way will you choose? Jesus is saying, the road to eternal life is narrow. Follow me and I will lead you there. Right? G Jesus went so far, by the way, to say, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. And, and by the way, it wasn't just Jesus that said this. His disciples continued this teaching. In Acts 4, 12, you can see that Peter stands up and says, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. So then we move this all the way into our modern context, and we hear Jesus wrapping up this sermon, and we have to say, as disciples of the way of Jesus, we must also affirm this teaching. We have to continue, just as the disciples of Jesus have done for generations, we must continue to resist the teaching that says that if you're just a good person, you can get to heaven. Because the... The, the truth is, and I, I don't want to take too much time here, but you're not good enough to meet the, the standard to get into heaven based on your behavior. Because the standard to get into heaven based on your behavior is be perfect and never have sinned one single time. And for the record, you messed that up so long ago. Like, it's not even worth the conversation anymore. So we're thankful that God has made another way. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this in the message. He says, this is Matthew 7, 13 and 14. He says, don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easy way, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though the crowds of people do. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. So someone might ask the question then, what does it look like to give total attention to the way of life? In other words, you're saying, how do I get in? If, if there's only just one way, and Jesus would reply to you, it looks like living the kind of life I've been describing in, like for the last seven months. Go back and read the Sermon on the Mount and live that. 
as a commitment to the way of Jesus. So the way of Jesus, the way to life, looks like living by the Sermon on the Mount in relationship with the one who delivered it. His name is Jesus. So again, there's, there's a million other teachings out there. There's all kinds of books, you know, there's all kinds of self-help programs. Listen to a podcast. It'll tell you the 17 things you can do uh, so that you can live a healthy, happy, wonderful life and be successful. But nothing outside of Jesus, who is the way and is the word of God, not a single thing outside of him will lead to eternal life. We have to say this unapologetically. And, and by the way, pro tip, side point, it would be good as Christians if we could learn how to say this lovingly. I, and if you want some help on that, go back a few weeks. We have it on YouTube. It's on the podcast on iTunes. Listen to the sermon about not being judgmental. We've got to learn how to tell this truth lovingly, right? So a simple rule of life. If a way of living does not agree with Scripture then that is not a way you should be living. That's the rule of life here. If it doesn't agree with Scripture, you don't need to be living that way. So Jesus says, be careful not to place your hope in misguided ways. And then second, Jesus warns us not to place our hope in misinformed teachers. You'll remember this is the part of the sermon where Jesus says, be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. He says, you'll recognize them by their fruit. And remember, he goes into this illustration. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. It can only produce good fruit. A bad tree can only produce bad fruit. He says that a number of different ways. And then he wraps up by saying, on the last day, on the day of judgment, when these people will face judgment for eternity. When, when they figure out which gate they tried to enter into, Jesus will look at them and they'll say, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. And he'll say, I never actually knew you. Here, here's what we need to understand. Jesus is warning us all, all these years ago, and it turns out it's still relevant today, that there will be people who call themselves Christians. Now, we're not talking about the 4,000 Uh, 300, give or take, other religions in the world. We're talking about people who call themselves Christians, who say that they speak for God, but actually are what Jesus would call false prophets. These people still exist today. They are still active today. By the way, it's super ironic that I'm going to teach you as a, <clears throat> as, a, as a person claiming that I'm talking about God's word today. Like as a pastor, it's ironic that I'm about to tell you, watch out for the bad ones. I, the irony of that is not lost on me. <laughs> but, uh, but let's see what the word says. Don't, don't take my word for it. It, it. Jesus is actually clear about two things here about false prophets. Number one, he's, he says that these people don't even know God, let alone speak for him, Right? He says that. But then number two, in in the subtlety of the way he ends this story, he says they are actually deceived into thinking that they do know God and that they do speak for him. Because they're going to get to the end and be surprised. So these these are not people who don't claim Christianity. These are people who call themselves Christian leaders. God would say some of them are false prophets. If you're waiting for me to tell you which denomination or name names, you are at the wrong church. (laughs) It's important, by the way, um, to understand that when Jesus said, go away from me, I never knew you. What he's talking about is, I never had a personal relationship with you. God knows everybody. He, He knows about everybody. He knows everything about everybody. But he doesn't have a personal relationship. In fact, the, the original word that Jesus uses here when he's trying to make this point is the same kind of word when he says knew you. It's the same kind of word that is used when describing the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife. That they would know each other intimately, physically, and, and emotionally, and spiritually. And God would say, I never had an intimate relationship with you. See, false prophets claim to speak for God, but they lack a relationship with God. And again, we have to be very, very careful here because we have to remember, again, Jesus is teaching on judgment. We need to learn how to recognize false prophets. We will never be hired to do the job of judging these people. 
You never get to be the judge unless you'd like to also be judged. Go back and listen to that sermon. But Jesus does say that we can know a person is a false prophet by looking at their fruit. In other words, uh, fruit is something that represents the content of a person's character, the way that they live and engage in the world. And fruit also is something that represents the direction or purpose or heart of their teaching, right? So let me give you a a couple of ideas. If, If you look at the life or the fruit of a person who claims to speak for God, they will produce the kind of fruit that reveals their nature. They're either going to be a good tree and produce good fruit, or they're going to be a bad tree and produce bad fruit. Okay, so my job as your pastor today is not to name names. It's to tell you how to recognize, because that's what Jesus says, be on your guard against false prophets. They'll come looking like they're on your team, but they're actually wolves looking to devour and destroy. So look at the fruit. So here are some ways that you can look at the fruit. If you're, if you're listening to, a, to like me or, or another teacher, a person who claims to speak for God, is that person loving, generous, and kind, or are they rude and self-serving? Or are they looking for a, a personal platform, or are they looking to elevate others and, and help people be moved toward Jesus? Are they submitted to leadership, or have they left the church claiming that they actually don't need to be under authority because they carry enough authority? Right? Uh, do, do they live in unity with fellow Christians, even fellow Christians who don't go to the same church as them? Or do they tear other Christians down? Are you beginning to see kind of a picture of what it might look like? Uh, does, uh, does this person uh, preach what the Word of God says? Or do they use the Word of God to preach an agenda? Do they encourage me as I listen to them to follow God's will? Or, or do they encourage me to pursue comfort or to pursue their will? One of the ways that you know the answer to that question is if you disagree with them on something that they recommend that's their opinion, how do they treat you after you disagree with them? If you've suddenly been excommunicated because you had a disagreement, that might be a false prophet, right? Right? Oh, by the way, keep in mind, this is not a conversation about your friends. We're talking about your, the people who claim to be your teachers. Jesus is being very specific. People who stand up and claim as, as an authority voice to be a teacher, a pastor, a prophet, a, a, an apostle, or whatever, right? Okay. The, the way you deal with your friends when they say stuff like that is, well, we, there's another, Jesus has another sermon about that. We'll talk about that some other Sunday. All right. And finally, I might say, do, do these people bring peace about my relationship with Jesus, or, or do they bring doubts about my relationship with Jesus? So these are the sorts of things that you might look for. If you look at their fruit, then you'll know what kind of a person or what kind of a prophet they are. And then Jesus doubles down on this idea in this very point when he says a good tree cannot produce uh, bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. In other words, if a person is If you discover that they are a false prophet, then everything they produce is sour, right? So we need to stop doing the thing, and I don't know if you do this, but we do this in church culture, where we look at teachers and we go, man, they've got some flawed character issues, but man, they can preach a really fiery three-point sermon. We need to be careful not to justify talent when their character is bad, right? Right? There's a lot of other things I could say there. I think you get the point. But I would just say this. Remember, God will determine if these people get into heaven. That is never your job. But you are to determine if they get your attention. One of the biggest gifts in the modern world for the Christian is how easy it is for us to have access to the preached Word of God, right? Because of things like YouTube, because of things like podcasts, I know people in this church who will come here on a Sunday and they'll listen to three different preachers before they come back around on Sunday. I know this because you guys post about it on Facebook. I love that, except for the moments when I don't. (laughs) Because one of the greatest problems we have in the church is the proliferation of really bad teaching. We have to be careful. 
It's not our job to run around going, ah, so and so's a false prophet. Let's shut down all of their. Like, why would you waste your time? Spend your energy preaching the gospel, right? If you see the bad news, preach the good news, right? Don't waste your time calling people out. Just love the people that are in front of you, right? But be very careful who you listen to. And if you, if you would be so bold and confident as to call yourself a teacher or a preacher of the Word of God in any context, please make sure that you meet up to the requirements and the checklist and that if you say anything heretical uh, ever and someone calls you on it, that you correct that rather than say, ah, no, I got it right, right? Anyway, 2021, it's good if you learn to be correctable and humble. Amen. All right. So Jesus so far has warned us not to put our hope in misguided ways or misinformed teachers. And then third, he says, don't look for hope in misplaced confidence. You remember this. You've probably heard it before, and I'll just remind you again. Jesus says, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock, right? The storm comes and the house stands. If you hear the word of God and you don't act on them, you'll be like a person, the foolish person, who builds your house on the sand. Same storm comes, and what happens to your house? Collapses. And I love this. He says, it collapsed with a great crash, right? So let's break that down. Jesus is saying, the house is your life. The house is the kind of life you build. The rock or the sand, like the, the wide or the narrow way, is the foundation on which you build your life or the way you choose to build your life. What are the truths that you root your life on? And then the storm is the trials of life or the temptations to sin or the, the invitations to go and walk in a different way. So after everything that Jesus has said, he wants you to know that the choice is yours. Notice that he doesn't say, okay, now that you've heard this, you all lose your free will, here's where you're going to build your house. He says, if you're going to build a house on a rock, this is what happens. If you build your house on sand, this is what happens. You get to decide. I've preached this fire sermon. It's, it's good enough that it should have informed you really well on what it looks like to build your house on the rock. And Jesus was sneaky. He snuck something in there, by the way. He said, it's not enough that you just hear the sermon. He says, the person who builds their house on the rock, it's like the person who hears my word and acts on it, right? Who, who doesn't just, Pastor Mark thinks that I sound like a frog today, so I'm going to take his word for it. Thanks, Pastor Mark. Give it up for Pastor Mark. Bring in water. What a guy. Did it help, Mark? Am I, do I sound? Okay. He left. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> okay, so obviously we know there's all kinds of places that you can build your house, right? There's all kinds of stuff that you can build your foundation on. Uh, the way that we would say this in 2021 is we would say there's all kinds of truths that you can choose to believe and then build your life on that truth, Right? I, one of the most popular truths, ironically, in 2021 is that there's no such thing as absolute truth, which is an absolute statement. The irony. But whatever you choose to build your life on, Jesus says only one of those will withstand the storms of life. I love this, by the way. I love the subtle grace and love in this idea that Jesus doesn't say, for some of you, storms will come. He just says, you're going to build a house, a storm is coming. Storms will come. I'm telling you now, because I love you, build your house on the right foundation so when the storm comes, your life and your faith and your relationship with Jesus doesn't completely fall apart. And here we see that Jesus has brought his conclusion full circle with this metaphor. If you build your life on all the ways of the world, or if you follow all of the teachings of whoever sounds appealing, or if you live your life however makes you feel good, then you will find that your foundation will not be strong. But if you build your life on the Word, if you follow the way and you listen to the One, then you'll have built your life on the rock. So again, the choice is ours. Jesus says, place your hope in the solid rock, which is Jesus and the Word. It's me. Jesus says, I'm, <laughs> place your hope in me. 
and your faith will withstand every single storm. So what will you build your life on? Do you want to know how you can test what you're building your life on? What do you spend your time giving attention to? Is it social media? Is it a show? Is it, God forbid, the news? <laughs> I don't use language like God forbid from the pulpit very often. I think I, I, that's the first time I've ever said that. But God forbid you build your life on the news. I don't know that you've ever heard the truth on any station. Other than like when they said what day it was. I'm not even sure they were telling you the truth when they told you the weather. I know I said I wasn't going to name names. Sorry. Forgive me. Look, I get your attention for 45 minutes a week. Thanks for that. I'm deeply honored by that. Where do you put your attention every other hour of your week? You know, I, I've been in the homes of people who have news channels on constantly or who are constantly checking social media, constantly reading the opinions of other people. And do you know what those homes are like? They're stressful. They're very often hopeless, and they have very many enemies. And the enemies are whoever's watching the other network, whoever voted for the other party, in some cases whoever has the different color skin. What would it be like if you gave the bulk of your attention to the Word of God? And I said it before, we live in a world where that is possible. You don't have to just listen to me preach this sermon over and over and over. You could listen to all kinds of good teachers. You could, you could pick up the Bible and read it. If you don't have the, the attention span for that yet, download the Bible app and have somebody else read it to you. There's lots of really good ways. The question is, where, what are you going to build your life on? And I could tell what you're building your life on by what you give your attention to. Okay, so we, we've been learning from the Sermon on the Mount for seven months. And, and, and this is the largest chunk that we've covered in one single Sunday, and it's because ultimately Jesus, in this massive piece of teaching, has said one thing. It, it's, it's almost as if he's sitting on the side of this hill teaching this sermon and at the very end of it, it's almost as if he, he leans forward. Almost as if he's like a mentor teaching his, his disciple. It's almost as if he could have prefaced this whole section by saying, oh, okay, I've said all of that, now pay attention because I'm going to give you some really good advice. Do you want to know how to live this out? I'm going to tell you three things right now. Pay attention. Like he's leaning in, right? And he says all of this. After everything you've heard, here is my final advice. You have one life. How will you spend it? Where will you invest it? Who will you let lead your life? Will it be the loudest voice in the room, or will it be the solid rock? Where do you want to spend eternity? Amen. What would it look like if you woke up every day making a decision that built the kind of life that led to eternal life? This is what Paul was talking about when he said, I die daily. Every single day I make that decision. Isn't it interesting that it turns out that this is like the primary teaching of all of Scripture? You have one life. I'm giving you an opportunity to build the kind of life I would love for you to live because I know what is best for you. And so I've made it very clear. Choose wisely. God says it in the Old Testament to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 30 when he says, I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life 
so that you and your descendants may live. And then he says a little bit about what that looks like. Love the Lord your God. Obey him and remain faithful to him. For he is your life and he will prolong your days as you live in the land the Lord swore to give you your ans- to your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said that before Jesus in the old covenant. He said you have an option, death and life. Please choose life. Jesus teaches this same idea more than once, not just in the Sermon on the Mount. In John chapter 10, uh, we see John recording Jesus to say, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. He was using a, a sheep herding metaphor and, at that moment. And then he says this, John 10.10, 10, which is a verse that we've quoted here quite frequently at Life Church, where Jesus says, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance or have it to the fullest or have it overflowing. God is not interested when he says the way is narrow, the, the, way, the gate is narrow and the way is hard. He's not interested in, in being cruel. He's showing you because he loves you and he wants you to have a good, abundant, overflowing, and eternal life. He's showing you the way because he loves you. But Jesus is saying every one of us gets to choose. I don't even get to choose for my kids. They get to choose. Which road will you travel? Which teachers will you listen to? Which foundation will you build your life on? Will you choose life or death? Will your life be found ready or will it be found wasted? The good news is that Jesus has already chosen you. Because this, this is the same Jesus who says, for God loved the world this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, will not die, but have everlasting life. Of course, you know, that's John three sixteen. So here's Jesus leaning in, right? Offering real hope under two conditions. Believe that Jesus is God and live submitted to his way of living. It's that easy and that impossibly difficult. (laughs) Thank God that all things are possible with Christ who gives us strength. Everything comes down to how you respond to this invitation. Everything, the entire Sermon on the Mount comes down to how do you respond to the invitation to build your life on his foundation, to walk in his way, to enter through his gate, to to put off all of the bad teachers, to shut them out. Don't worry about judging them, but stop listening to all that mess. How do you respond to Jesus? And as we come to the end of a sermon that has taken us seven months to preach, I want to invite you to take a moment. In fact, close your eyes right now, and I just want to invite you to a moment of an encounter, if you will. Can you imagine Jesus sitting on the side of a hill? He said all of these things. He's leaning forward. He's anticipating your response because he loves you. How do you respond to Jesus' offer of hope and life? How do you respond to his question as to whether or not you've been chasing hope in places other than him or listening to teachers who would lead you astray? How do you respond to his invitation to trust the wisdom of the word instead of the opinions of the world? If there's anything that you would say to Jesus right now, I just want to invite you to say it. Thank you, Jesus. If there's any decisions you feel like you need to make about your personal relationship with Jesus, if that's you making that decision today, I just want to invite you. Find find a leader. Pastor Mark's going to be at one of these prayer walls after service. You just grab him. If you don't know who Pastor Mark is, he was that Canadian guy that brought me water a few minutes ago. Just find him. Tell him him about what you're deciding today. Tell him what you're wrestling with. Tell him what you're feeling. 
You can find me, find my wife, find one of our leaders. If you're nervous about finding a leader, find a person with a smile on. <laughs> Just tell them, talk. But don't let today go by. Because I can't promise you that a storm won't come tomorrow. Be ready. When Jesus had finished these sayings, Matthew 27, 20, or 7, 28, when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like the scribes. Jesus gets up and he walks down the mountain and he's done preaching the greatest sermon of all time. Jesus, may we constantly be astonished by your teaching, just like the crowd was that day, because you do not have to offer us the same things the world offers. Your teaching is better. May we find hope in you alone. We know that we do. May we choose you. Thank you for the life that you offer us. Help us to live life your way. May your words be enough for us. And may we be found in eternal life. God, I pray that Life Church would be a church full of people that live to honor you and to bless those around us as we stand on the solid rock of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.